in another place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the in the Quran saying to the Prophet قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهُ وَاحِدٌ Let's say that verily I am a human like you are. I mean, some, some people manipulate this. They, re, they read this in a corrupt manner by saying, I am not a human like you. Trying to make him some superhuman uh, or rather beyond human. The Prophet was definitely a superhuman. There's no doubt about that. But... He was a human being. And that doesn't decrease his status. I don't know why people should think that he should decrease his status in any way. So he says that I'm clearly a, a human like you. But you ilayya, I receive revelation. And the revelation I receive and the message for me to you is that your Lord is one Lord. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. تبارك الله ما وحي بمكتسب ولا نبي على غيب بمتهم كم أبرأت كم أبرأت وصبا باللمس راحته وأطلقت أربا من ربقة اللمم وأحيت السنة الشهباء دعوته حتى حكت غرة في الأعصر الدهم بعارض جاد أو خلت البطاح بها سيب من اليم أو سيل من العرم دعني ووصفي آيات له ظهرت ظهور نار القرى ليلا على علمي فالدر يزداد حسنا وهو منتظم وليس ينقص قدرا غير منتظم So in these poems the author continues his discussion and praise of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم so after mentioning everything that he has in this number 84, he says, Tabarak Allah, ma wahyun bi muktasabin, wala nabiyun ala ghaybin bi muttahami. Blessed is Allah. Tabarak Allah. Allah be blessed. So it's an exclamation in the middle. Just dhikr of Allah in between. Either for tabarruk reasons, either for gaining barakah. When you say Allah is blessed, then his blessings come down upon you. So, Tabarakallahu Ahsanul Khariqeen, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, praising Himself. So, Tabarakallah. So, blessed is Allah. Revelation is not acquired. Wahi, which is the specific revelation for prophets, is not acquired. It's not something that you can acquire by any form of exercise, any form of acquisition. It's something that is God given. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not something that you can put any effort to get if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to have it. So you have to be a prophet to have wahi. Nor is a prophet to be accused when he speaks of hidden things. So since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides revelation directly to the prophets, especially to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah is the knower of the unseen. He is the omniscient one. He knows everything. Then clearly, when the Prophet ﷺ speaks of unseen things, then he, people should not be suspicious about him being incorrect about them, him being wrong about them. Because obviously his source is the Allam al is the one who is the knower of all unseen things. So, the poem, in this poem, the poet first starts it off, like the Prophet ﷺ sometimes did, he's used the statement Subhanallah, Tabarakallah. So as we say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Tabarakallah, it's Allah is blessed. So the Prophet ﷺ has a very high status. How blessed is Allah that he gave our Rasulullah ﷺ that status. And then he said, it's such a status that the wahi and revelation he receives is not something that he could have acquired on its own on his own it's something that can't be acquired through any kind of strategy it has to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically choosing an individual for that and that's why we say Nabi Mustafa Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Murtada Mustafa and Murtada means exactly that specially selected one 
Mustafa means specially se selected one. Actually, it comes from the word Safa. Safa means pure. So clearly, the one who Allah chooses is pure, the one purely chosen out of everyone else. And Murtada comes from Rida. Rada, which means to be satisfied and pleased. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with him among everybody else. It doesn't mean that he's not pleased with anybody else, but he's pleased with him for this position. So he becomes the Mustafa and the Murtada. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can specify and give his rahmah to whoever he wishes. And he decided to give it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in nahnu illa basharun mithlukum. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, humans, they are, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, I'm just a human like you. In nahnu illa basharun mithlukum. We're just humans, insan, bashar, just like you. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَمُنُّ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bestow his favors upon whoever he wishes. So we are humans like you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is a human being born from a mother and father, blood and flesh, but he has been especially selected. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selects somebody, Allah is the nur samawati wal ard. So the Prophet Sallallahu has the greatest of nur and that's why his dua was, Oh Allah, grant me nur in front of me, on, on my right, on my left, behind me, above me. Oh Allah, make me nur. But that doesn't detract from the fact that he's still a human being in his origin and nature and reality. But he's a special human being. That's, that's the way you reconcile that. In another place, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the, in the Quran, saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهُ وَاحِدٌ Let's say that verily I am a human like you are. I mean some, some people manipulate this. They, re, they read this in a corrupt manner by saying I am not a human like you. Trying to make him some superhuman uh, or rather beyond human. The Prophet ﷺ was definitely a superhuman. There's no doubt about that. But he was a human being. And that doesn't decrease his status. I don't know why people should think that he should decrease his status in any way. So he says that I'm clearly a, a human like you. But you ha ilayya, I receive revelation. And the revelation I receive and the message for me to you is that your Lord is one Lord. There's numerous others. Okay, so that was nubuwa and wahi. But wilaya. Wilaya means to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah making somebody close to him, taking him as a friend. When you take somebody as a friend, you look after them. So it's in that sense, not the friends of this world. This is true friendship. That's wilaya, closeness, to be a wali of Allah. That can be acquired from doing effort and trying your best, waking up at night, doing your night vigils, praying to Allah, avoiding the harams, fulfilling the obligations, <coughs> and doing the additional deeds to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is an attainable rank, unlike prophecy, which is chosen by Allah and only given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, of course, even in this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who helps. Because as Ibn Ata'illah says that don't rejoice when you do a good deed, thinking that it came from you. Because though it did seem that it came from us and we, for the first time, we did tahajjud prayer. So it came from us. It feels like a self-accomplishment. So he says, but don't rejoice that it came from you. Rejoice that it came from Allah to you. In the sense that Allah was the one who enabled you to do it. Otherwise, we'd never be able to do it. So go a bit further. Don't just look at yourself, but look at the original giver, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a... So, so the status of wilaya is gained by effort, by working hard, abstaining and trying to do more in getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's another level, which is called the level of the majdhub. The majdhub. The majdhub is somebody who is generally not in control of their faculties. You, you see many people who are not in control of their faculties. But the many that we see, they seem to be insane. They do crazy things. They do dis un unhonorable things. They don't, in their, 
state that is different from normal people, they're not exactly worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're doing crazy things that brings their dignity down, that lowers their honor. But then you get those who seem to be not with us, but they are always with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can clearly see that. Because they're constantly either engaged in dhikr, they seem to be on another cloud, they seem to be somewhere else, thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they also seem not in control of their external senses in this world because they don't speak to you properly maybe, they say some really strange things that are of a very high realm. They're called the majdhub. That's a different state. For them, the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just becomes rolled up and shortened. But that's not necessarily what you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. The better state is to be sane and understanding and then to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while interacting with everybody around you. That's accomplishment. So about the madhub, they actually pray just with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favor upon them. They, they're able to do all of these extra prayers and all these extra worships through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's direct. But then they lose out in the world, but they don't care. No prophet can be accused of any kind of misunderstanding, a misrevelation, dis, uh, misinformation about what he says of the ghayb because he is speaking on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah says وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى He doesn't speak on his own behalf, just what he feels like. He speaks, this is based on revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, turning on to something else, كَمْ أَبْرَأْتَ وَصِبًا بِاللَّمْسِ رَاحَتَهُ وَأَطْلَقَتْ أَرَبًا مِنْ رِبْقَةِ اللَّمَمِ What that means is how many patients, patients, how many sick people, how many ill people were healed by his hand's touch? How many madmen did he release from their chains? So within this whole poem, he covers every aspect of the Sharia, every, every aspect of the seerah of Rasulullah So what you have here is now he's speaking about the Prophet's ability to cure people. And in this, what he's also doing is that he's showing that the Prophet's miracles and what he did also encompassed the miracles of the other Prophets. So where Isa السلام, is known to have done many great things when it came to curing people, the Prophet ﷺ was able to do that all the time as well. But that wasn't the main miracle that stood out. It was just one of the many, many, many miracles. And we have a number of stories in that regard as well. So what he's saying here is that there's a number of times when the Prophet ﷺ either physically used his hand, as the poet is saying here, and he felt the hand in his dream. So for him, it becomes a kind of a reality, a virtual reality. Right? But when you see the Prophet ﷺ, it's supposed to be a reality, as said by the Prophet ﷺ himself. So, is it really still virtual or is it real? Virtual reality? What kind of reality is it? Is that a special category of reality? You know, which is the vision of Rasulullah ﷺ. But he felt it and he became better. But then, this is not something that just happened just to him uniquely and only him. But of course, it happened during the time of Rasulullah ﷺ. There were a number of people that the Prophet ﷺ uh, touched. Uh, either touch them, wiped his hand over their back or their head or uh, uh, put his saliva and, and they became better. And it's something that was witnessed by many, many, many people by the barakah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he says, وَأَطْلَقَتْ أَرَبًا مِنْ رِبْقَةِ اللَّمَمِ So, كَمْ أَبْرَأْتَ وَصِبًا وَصِبًا means maridan, marid. It means a, a diseased, a, a, somebody with a disease or illness of some sort. Billamsi rahat, or just by touching with his hand. Lams, touching. And wa atlaqat araban min ribqatil lamami. And araban, this refers to a person who is not sane, a person who's become insane, a person who's become crazy, who's lost his mind. How many crazy people, either due to uh, having fits, or real jinn or some other kind of effect. How many people like this, they were removed from the knots that had tied them. And that's exactly what it is. 
Removal of evil spirits from a person is like untying a knot that you can't untie. Because people who have this problem, they feel like they are shackled. They are restricted. It's, when, when, when you are possessed by something, whatever that may be, you lose your freedom of some sort. You become restricted. You can't do what you want. There are certain times of the day when you are used to doing something or you just start feeling restricted either in your mind or physically or something like that happens. So it's like somebody is tied knots around you, has changed, chained you. So here he's saying, how many has he set free like that? So when the Prophet ﷺ used to pass his hand over someone, they used to become better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to give the person shifa. Of course, it's the Allah who gives the shifa. But then these are, the Prophet ﷺ is just used as a means there. That's of the mu'jiza and the miracles of Rasulullah ﷺ. Anybody who wants more details about this, about all of his miracles, then he should look in Qadi Iyad is a shifa. Qadi Iyad is a shifa is this beautiful seerah that is not like this life story as mentioned in other seerah books where they take you from prior to birth to birth and, and continue but he his is a thematic seerah where he discusses the different aspects of Rasulullah's life and everything associated in a thematic fashion where he talks about all the miracles in one place he speaks about the features in one place he speaks about the different aspects in different places like that so there was an individual whose name was Hamdala ibn Huzaym. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam put his head, uh, put his hand on his head, and he made du'a of bar for barakah for him. And then it was such that anybody who would be brought to Hamdala with any anybody who would be brought with some kind of uh, skin problem or some kind of boil or some kind of other issues with his skin. And that would be placed in where Rasulullah's hand had touched on uh, this Hudayfa, a Hanzala, it would become better. So, not only did it benefit him, but he was able to then benefit others through that as well. There was another young boy who had a problem, some, some problem on his head. So the Prophet, and the hair would not grow there either. The Prophet Sallallahu he passed his hand over it. And his hair started growing and it became completely fine. There was Shurahbil al-Ju'fi. He, he had some problem in his, in his hand by which he couldn't hold a sword properly. He wasn't able to hold a, hold a sword. He wasn't able to grab onto it properly. Some kind of paralysis or whatever it was. He couldn't hold onto the reins of his horse. That was something very important for them to use their tools like that. He mentioned that to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ just um, uh, touched it a few times, pressed it a few times until eventually all that problem disappeared. It's related from Qatada ibn Nu'man that once his eye in one of the battles it was affected. During Uhud it was affected, his, his eye such that it actually came out, his eyeball came out, essentially. And when he went to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ, he performed the surgery right there, you know, without any anesthetics. And he just put it back in and he says that he could now see from that eye much better. It became much better than the other one. Imam Nasai is related from Uthman ibn Hunayf, that he once became blind. He wasn't able to see anymore, whether that be through cataract or whatever it may be. Allah knows best. He came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he said, "Make du'a that Allah subhanahu wa taala remove <clears throat> this veil, this covering that has come over my eyes, because that's exactly what it is." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Go and make wudu, and then read this du'a." This hadith is related by Tirmidhi. It's a very interesting hadith. And the first time I saw it, it was... Um, I had to read it a few times. Because it forms the basis for tawassul and the concept of istighatha. Anyway, he said, Go and do wudu, then read the following dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka. وَأَتَوَجَّهُ إِلَيْكَ بِنَبِيِّكَ مُحَمَّدْ نَبِيِّ الرَّحْمَةِ 
يا محمد إني أتوجه بك إلى ربك أن تكشف عن بصري اللهم شفعه فيا Generally du'as were never made like this but this was a very unique du'a that was made or the Prophet told him to make what he said is go make wudu then say the following du'a Oh Allah I ask you and I turn to you through your Prophet or by your Prophet Muhammad the Prophet of mercy and then O oh Muhammad O oh Muhammad I turn through you to your Lord I turn through you or by you to your Lord that you remove from my eyes meaning you you uh, remove this veil from my eyes this covering from my eyes oh Allah make him an intercessor for me or accept his intercession on my behalf so this is where the ulama take the dalil of istighatha from istighatha means to say uh, where you hear some people saying Ya Abdul Qadir Madad Ya Rasulullah Madad Now the, the, the problem with, with saying that is an aqidah problem Saying the words themselves the meaning is clearly as uh, he says to, if, you, if, you, if you deconstruct this the first part is turning to Allah then turning to the Prophet Sallallahu then turning back to Allah so the dua is to Allah but just using the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in between. So what the ulama explain is that this is just another way of tawassul. Because of the special status that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has, you're asking Allah that this Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who I'm, who, who's told me to do this, he has a special status by you and I want you to accept my dua for me. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught him to do. So they say that even though he seems to be in the middle calling to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's actually calling to Allah because Allah is the giver and that's agreed upon. Now what you have, now if you go to the Indian subcontinent so now you had a bit of problem there there was a controversy about this issue what you had is you had one group who promoted the idea of doing this to such a degree it became so popular that many people on the street, low down, they would actually just do this form of istighatha and slowly, slowly, this complicated understanding or this sophisticated understanding of who you're really calling upon, Allah, was probably taken out of the picture because not everybody stays so sophisticated in that understanding, not everybody so refined. So slowly, slowly, you'd hear people saying, Ya Abdul Qadir Madad, I remember as a, when I was much younger, maybe about six, seven years old, I had a there's a person that uh, there's another boy who was a friend of mine when he'd go running he would say he'd, he'd say these weird words and I would say well, was, he says well if you say Ya Ali I, I thought he's saying Ya Ali Ya Ali not even Ya Ali do you understand because he'd said, he, he would say Ya Ali and then he would go so and I said what are you doing he says well if you say Ya Ali Ya Ali <laughs> oh Lee Bruce Lee you know <laughs> right <laughs> it, it, they don't even know what they're saying sometimes, that's what I'm trying to say. So, if you say that, it'll make you run faster. I can't remember if I've done it or not, but it was kind of weird. It was weird. Um, but that all comes from the fact that now this young, child, this young guy, six, seven years old, he's saying, Ya Ali. It comes, the origin is from this. But the Prophet Wasallam, I don't think in any other place does he ever do this again. This is only in this one narration. One narration. So you've got a group of people who will say this and then eventually their aqidah becomes, their belief becomes that I am calling upon that person directly. Then you've got another group who looked at this and said, look, this is totally wrong. So it's wrong to say this. <clears throat> the reason they said it's wrong to say this is because of the corrupt aqidah that they saw in people. So they said, look, let's just close the door for this because it's too complicated for people to, be, have this, to have this sophisticated understanding when they do this. And it's not necessary. It's one time the Prophet ﷺ did this. So let's just tell people, don't do this. That's why then it became like a, di a distinguishing feature of Masajid that you, if you saw Ya Muhammad in there, it belonged to a certain group. And if it didn't say Ya Muhammad, if you look around, it say Ya Allah and just Muhammad and not Ya Muhammad, right? Then it belonged to another group. Whereas there's nothing wrong with having Ya Muhammad up there as long as your aqidah is sahih. In fact, the people from the second group that 
that, that said it's wrong to say this, they actually started believing it's wrong to say Ya Muhammad. Right? So, Ya Muhammad is totally wrong to say. Whereas, if you look at some of the poems of uh, poetry of uh, people, even like Hakim al Maulana Shavari Tanwi, he has istighatha in there. To Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, it's in there. But clearly, so now let's understand this. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf uh, Ludhiani, he explained this very well in Zikhtilaf al Ummah Sirati Mustaqim. He says that when you say Ya Rasulullah, when you say, there's, there's many women and men for that matter as well, something wrong happens to them or something falls, they say, Oh Ma, Oh Mum. Right? Uh, have you heard that? There's people who say, Oh Ma, Oh Bab, Oh Babre. They say these weird things, you know, like this, my father, my mother, whatever. Now, clearly, they don't mean that. The poets say, Ya Naseem as Sabah, Oh cool breeze of the morning in a poem. So you're calling out to things, but it's just part of a poem. It's part of speech to do that. You don't really mean that the morning, the cool breeze of the morning is going to hear you. Nobody believes that. So there's one way which is to say it in a poetic fashion, as an exaggeration, making the one who's not present, present or making the non-rational being a rational being and addressing them. It's just all part of strategies in poetry. So clearly that's permitted because that's poetry. Everybody would understand that you're not really calling out to them. So what is then prohibited is if you call out to them directly thinking that they directly can help you. Whether they are alive or not. Of course if they're in front of you and you call to them, that's different. Then they will help you. But if they're not around, then you call unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, if somebody does this with a sahih aqidah, we can't say it's wrong because there's a basis for it in the hadith in Tirmidhi. But we're not going to encourage it because dhahiran it seems like shirk. That's why the Deobandis, for example, don't encourage it because it seems dhahiran shirk. And it does lead to a corruption. Just by the one example that I have had. In fact, I've had two examples. Then I had a, mashallah, very sophisticated example where once I was sitting in Damascus in the masjid waiting for, to, to, for the shaykh to uh, the other students to finish so I could go in and read my, my uh, part of the Quran that I need to read that day and there was a, a, a brother another student who was there that I'd spoken to a number of times and as I'm sitting there suddenly he says Ya Abdul Qadir Madad suddenly he turned around to him I said what are you saying so he says uh, Ya Abdul Qadir Madad I said, Abdul Qadir, which Abdul Qadir are you speaking about? He says, Abdul Qadir Jilani, Shaykh Akbar, you know, Ghaus Azam. And then, I, and then I said, but how can you say that? He's not here. So then he brought me this hadith. That was the first time that I recall reading this hadith in that context. I studied Tirmidhi before that, but I think I just passed by. I didn't really focus on it. I don't know what I was doing whether I was sleeping or what when I read this hadith the first time. And I must have read it because I read Tirmidhi to the teacher. I was the one who read it. So, Wallahu alam, I can't remember. Because you know, in that last year, you do read a lot. And it's difficult to remember everything. You're, you know, you're doing seven books of hadith or eight books of hadith, and there's thousands, 20, 30, 40,000 hadith you're reading that year. Anyway. So then I went out into the marketplace to look for a book. And. After checking a number of books to see on this subject, I came to one bookstore and the guy in there who's a mashallah, I really uh, got on with him, he was really knew his books and he, he was a student of the deen. He says, look, don't bother, you're not going to find something that will be moderate. You're either going to find books from the Salafis that everything is impermissible, even tawassul is impermissible, except with those who are alive or except with your deeds. Because they're very literalist in the way they've done things. So you're either going to find books from them where everything is haram and wrong and so on. Or you're going to find from the extreme Sufis where everything is permitted. You're not going to find a, a moderate discussion. If you do want a moderate discussion, it's in Malna um, Yusuf Ludhiyanwi's Ikhtilafi Ummat Ar-Sirati Mustaqim. 
it's in there, it's a moderate discussion, but I think I've clarified. So there is a basis for it. If somebody, an alim, somebody, you hear somebody from, do it, generally from Syria, etc., they don't have that aqidah of hadir nadir, that Sheikh Abdul Qadir is going to come and help you out. What they mean is, I am calling to Allah through the position that Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani has. That's why every time then it became a joke between us, um, whenever this student would see me and he'd say, Sayati Sheikh Abdul Qadir bin Baghdad bil qab wa yadribuka bil qab qab. He would say, It says Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani is going to come from Baghdad and he's going to hit you with the clogs. The reason why it's been prohibited by certain ulama is because just to stop the door, because Zahir, when you see somebody doing that, you think they're really calling out to such and such an individual, and then those individuals eventually start do start thinking that they are calling to those individuals. Then nobody calls on to Allah, then it's always like, uh, you know, oh, Shaykh Abdul Qadir, oh, Ghothi Adam, oh, this, oh, that. It's never Allah. Allah never comes into me. You don't need to call on to Allah anymore. You'll just call on to. So, that, just understand it like that, inshaAllah. Anyway, this Sahabi, he did exactly that as related. Uh, in this case, it's related from Nasai, but it's also in Tirmidhi, as far as I remember, Uthman ibn Hunayf. So when he went and he did this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him his sight back. His sight was regained. And in the second one, it's related from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, that once a woman came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa she wasn't necessarily insane, but she had this fits, uh, epileptic fits problem. And she said, you know, Ya Rasulullah, help me out here, make dua for me. So the Prophet sallallahu said, look, I can make dua for you, and Allah will remove it for you. But he gave her an option. Now, he wouldn't give everybody this option necessarily, but he knew the state of this woman, you know, that she had a heart to be able to deal with this. That there's something, a higher calling, there's a higher level, that you continue to be patient when you have these bouts of uh, fits, and Allah will elevate you, Allah will give you a higher reward. So then, look how intelligent she is, spiritually intelligent. Her... IQ is high, but then her SQ is also high. Um, IQ is intelligent quotient, right, which we all talk about. But you need a SQ, a spirituality quotient. That's very important to have a high spirituality quotient as well. So apparently that was very high. So she said, um, I become uncovered when this happens to me. And that is something I can't bear. So then the Prophet made dua that that wouldn't happen. So that wouldn't happen, but she still got the reward for being patient through her fits. Which is a really big thing for a lot of people here today who can't get cured for these things. If they just think of this woman and hold that same intention, subhanAllah, they get huge amounts of reward for that. That's maybe Allah's way of elevating their status. That's with any disease for that matter. You just have to be able to deal with it. So even the people of Allah, they have problems in this world, but they're just able to deal with it. They just don't fall down and become depressed. That's the difference between a wali of Allah and non wali of Allah. So now when people come and they call and they say, I'm depressed, this has happened, this has happened. And you think, and you think, well, I've had those kind of problems. You know, there's lots of people who have those kind of problems. So your problem is that you don't do dhikr of Allah. You're totally disassociated from Allah. Subhanahu. Your heart is dead. You may have a, mashallah, good body, everything, but your heart is dead. Start doing a regimen of dhikr, start focusing on that, take the haram out of your life, and you'll see that you'll be able to deal with the problems. Your strategy will work. They won't affect you. It's the problem of the heart. The heart governs your whole body and your thinking, your outlook, your emotion and everything. Right, the next point وَأَحْيَتِ السَّنَةَ الشَّحْبَاءَ دَعْوَتُهُ حَتَّى حَكَدْ غُرَّةً فِي الْأَعْصُرِ الدُّهُمِ A time of drought was given a new life by his call. After dull ages, a blaze of light, we see. So, having these number of years, these decades, dark. Darkness is around. Darkness is prevalent. Suddenly his da'wah comes in, and it's almost like you've got these years of drought which affect you drought <coughs> there's shortage of supplies 
then suddenly, mashallah, you have good crops, good produce, good production. There's going to be a marked difference that year. People will feel much better, much more pleasant, much more, they'll rejoice. So he's using that idea, which is very important because you're in the deserts. These kind of things happened a lot. When you had a good year of crops, you know, a good year of dates, etc. It was a good year. You really felt it. Today, we, we don't know whether it's a good or bad year. The only thing that happens for us is the prices go up. Otherwise, you still get mangoes, you know, 12 years, uh, sorry, 12 months of the year, except that they're just not from India or Pakistan, right? And when the Indian ones have stopped coming this year, the Pakistan is just doubled in price. And when they go out of season, then you get those from South America, which, do, which taste like, I don't know, they taste like something else, right? So water, watermelons, Costco will have them throughout the year. They're just not the Turkish ones, they're from somewhere else. So we just live in, mashallah, we, we don't know what it is. So you do feel, when that comes, suddenly it feels really nice. So that's what he's saying here. The same kind of thing. This is now the author indicating towards the Prophet's du'as being accepted. Because the Prophet's du'as were accepted. So now you have an individual whose du'as are accepted. So benefits now everybody. How? Rain. When there's a problem, there's a drought, Allah will send rain because of the du'a of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For example, it, it happened numerous times, but some of the more famous times is relating to Bukhari from Masruq. He says, once we were sitting with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. He said that once he saw that some of the people, he, he saw that there was generally this relaxing of attitude towards the deen by people. He felt that people were becoming a bit too cozy. They were, they were feeling, uh, he felt that people were, their efforts were not as much as they used to be before, maybe because they'd had a lot of great conquest and so on. So he said, Allahumma sab'an ka sab'i Yusuf. Oh Allah, bring down the seven like the seven of Yusuf, alayhi salam. So they were overtaken by drought. This affected the people of Makkah quite, quite hard. So much so that some people were forced to now eat corpses of animals because there was so much drought. They would look up to the heavens to look for water and what they could see is smoke. So this is their eyes now playing tricks on them because of severe dehydration. That's how it become, became for some people. So much so that the enemy Abu Sufyan had to then come to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "Ya Muhammad, inna ka ta'muru bi ta'atillah wa bi silatil rahim." You're the one who tells us that you must obey Allah. You instruct people that they must obey Allah, and they must also tie the knots of kinship. That you have to be good with your family members, your relatives, your blood, your kin. Wa inna qawma qad halaku. Your people in Makkah, your people, you know, they are your people at the end of the day, they're, they're being destroyed. Fad'ullah lahum. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. So, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fartaqib yawma ta'ti sama'u bi dukhanim mubin. Yakshan nasa, yakshan nasa, hadha adabun alim. And, Rabbana kshif anna al adaba inna mu'minun, anna lahum al dhikra wa kad jaahum rasulun mubin. Then eventually it says, الْبَطْشَةَ الْكُبْرَى Surah Al-Dukhan So, this Batshat Al-Kubra refers to the Battle of Badr and the Dukhan that took place. So the Prophet Wasallam obviously he makes his dua. Then Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, they relate from Anas Allah One day the Prophet Wasallam came into the masjid for Jumu'ah, khutbah. And he's standing up, he's giving his khutbah, and this man suddenly comes in from one of the doors. Ya Rasulullah, halakatil amwal wa ja'al iyal, wa anqata'atil subul, fad'ullah yughithana. In the middle of the khutbah, you can see how desperate he was. He said, Ya Rasulullah, all the wealth has been destroyed. Meaning all our crops, there, they're all dying. Families are extremely hungry. The paths have all stopped, have all been severed 
make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He help us in this. That He shower the rains. So the Prophet ﷺ immediately raised his hands. And he said, Allahumma aghithna. O oh Allah, shower us with rain. O oh Allah, grant us, bestow your wa the water upon us. Three times he made this dua. And Anas says, Wallahi ma nara fi samai min sahabin wala qaz'atin wala shay'an wa ma baynana wa bayna sila min baytin wala darin fatala'at min warahi sahaba mithla turs falamma tawassatat intasharat thumma amtarat fala wallahi ma ra'ayna shamsa sab'an he says that until now the sky was totally blue. This is what we've been looking for, haven't we? Blue skies. So he says the skies were totally blue, not a cloud in sight. Nothing in sight. And between us and Mount Sila, which is I think the boundary of Medina Munawwara, there's no house, no, no place where you know, there was anything of that nature. And suddenly from behind there, this cloud comes up, which was like a shield. It comes to the middle, then it spreads, and then it starts to shed its water. And after that, we did not see the sun for seven days. It was raining and raining. The next week, the Prophet ﷺ is giving his khutbah again. Now this man rushes inside again. From that same door, and he says to Rasulullah ﷺ, Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Rasulullah, halakatil amwal. Wealth, our wealth and our crops, everything, they've been destroyed again. <laughs> they were destroyed last week. He asked for rain, they destroyed. Watahaddamatil buyud, the, the houses are breaking down now. Because they were not made of what we have, it's made of uh, soil and uh, you know, date palms and things like that. Wanqata'atil subul, and now the paths have definitely been blocked for a different reason now. Fad'ullaha yumsikwa, tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to. Withhold the rain now. The Prophet ﷺ again raised his hand. He said, "Allahumma hawalaina wala alaina." So this time the Prophet ﷺ made a very particular dua. He said, "Oh Allah, around us and not upon us," because you don't want it to stop completely. You need the benefit of it. But oh Allah, around us, not upon us. Al al akam wa dhirab wa butun al awdiya wa manabit al shajar in the valleys, on the tops of the mountains, and in the roots of the trees. You know, th this is the kind of places where we want it, not upon us. So that's exactly what happened. He says, as soon as he made that dua, it stopped, and we went out walking in the sunshine again. So it, these kind of things have happened during the time of Rasulullah and he is indicating towards that. Now, how many years did it take him to write this poem? I don't know, but he's got a lot of information. All of these points, this seerah is in his mind just going through subhanAllah and he's just easily just taking through a lot of these poets they actually uh, poets are very ajib they they these things just come about sometimes when they don't have a dry moment when it's a, one of those moments they just come about and you know, they wonder where this is almost like most like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's just that in that kind of moment you want to be guided by allah not by the shaitan same thing with artists same thing with artists. One is that art which is inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the other which is the shaitani art. You go to the Tate. Modern art. Modern art is weird, man. There's one several years ago. He used elephant dung in his art because you have to come up with something unique. Sometimes you go into some of these galleries and you think it's a scribble. <laughs> but there's people who actually ap appreciate it. And if you criticize it, then you, you seem like a totally uninitiated amateur. Man, you don't understand that? I was like, I don't, sorry, I don't understand it. I don't know what that scribble is about. SubhanAllah. You just become famous and then after that you do a few scribbles and bring you a few million pounds. It's really good, isn't it? Well, there must be something in there that they see. Wallahu So in here what he does is, he says, Hatta hakat ghurratan fil a'suri duhumi. He enlivened da'watuhu, his du'as enlivened, revived, refreshed those years of drought. What that means is after dull ages, a blaze of light suddenly shone. Ghurra 
is Ghurrat al the brightness of our um, limbs from the washing of wudu on the Day of Judgment. But what it comes from, is it actually comes from the white patches on a horse. You, sometimes you get a black horse or a dark horse with white patches and they're supposed to be very valuable, the white. So it's called Ghurra. And Duhum, just darkness in these dark years. And this word is specifically brought here because for the Arabs, darkness was really bad. It was very miserable. It was something that just brought on a lot of gloom and doom. So he's saying he's really trying to make a, a big deal out of the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying that he was a blaze of light within this absolute darkness. بِعَارِضٍ جَادَ أَوْ خِلْتَ الْبِطَاحَ بِهَا سَيْبٌ مِّنَ الْيَمِّ أَوْ سَيْلٌ مِّنَ الْعَرَمِ من العرم. What that means is all by a rain-giving cloud or you would think the valleys were thus engulfed by the sea or by a flood of Arim's dam water. So when he made the dua and the dua was accepted based on the stories I just mentioned, then it seemed that this rain-giving cloud you think the valleys were now engulfed by the sea. The sea has suddenly come on the land. That's how much his dua would bring about. Or it was like the flood of Arim from the Yemen, that the, the, the flood of history that was mentioned in the Quran. So this is just the final point that he makes here, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would revive and refresh and bring the greenery back because of all of the water that came from his dua. <clears throat> that it almost seemed like he's brought the ocean onto the, onto the land. So we end here. There's a, the new section is about the Qur'an. So we'll move on to that insha'Allah next week. Jazakumullah khayran. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak ya dhal jalali wal ikram. Allahumma ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith. Allahumma ya hannanu ya mannan la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimin. جزا الله عنا محمد ما هو أهله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم Oh Allah accept our duas Oh Allah despite the darknesses of our hearts Oh Allah despite the impurity of our hearts and despite the weakness and despite the shortcomings that we have in even the way that we ask you O oh Allah, we, ha we don't know even the etiquette of asking you. But O oh Allah, we ask that you look, at you look at us with your mercy. Because your mercy is immense and it knows no bounds. O oh Allah, and your mercy is something that you like to exercise upon us. O oh Allah, so you have given us so many indications of the dominance of your mercy. By making us read, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Those characteristics of Rahman, Rahim, from mercy, that you make us read over and over again each day, just so that we can be focused on your mercy and not on your wrath. And O oh Allah, as we know from your Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that your mercy, has been, your mercy has been written as overcoming your anger and your wrath, as is written on your throne. O oh Allah, we know by this that you like to use your mercy, and we want to be the recipients of your mercy. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, don't deprive us, don't deprive us, don't make us of the wretched ones, don't make us of those who are prevented and blocked from your mercy and who invoke your wrath. O oh Allah, we know we do certain deeds and we have done certain deeds. O oh Allah, we have committed many sins that have prevented your mercy from coming down upon us, that has brought much depression in our lives, much concern and grief and problems in our life. But O oh Allah, we ask that you help us make that change and you give us enlightenment through your Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his teachings and you grant us his sunnah in our lives. And O oh Allah, we ask that you send your abundant blessings on our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you forgive us and you make us you, you, make, you allow us to be in his company, to drink from his hands from the hawd of Kawthar and then to be in his company in Jannatul Firdaus. O oh Allah, accept our du'as and make the best of our days the day that we stand in front of you. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifuna wa salamun ala al-mursaneen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously.
to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.